Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's been a busy news week for the Flames, and we're back. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. How you doing, buddy? Good, as always. I don't know about you, but here we sit early January, and it feels to me like we're finally at the make-or-break point in the season for the Flames. It seems like this is a time when they've got to put up or shut up when it comes to the postseason. What do you think? Yeah, and we're seeing a, a lot of uh, stellar performances from players and guys getting more opportunities to showcase what they can do. Others are getting moved to the sidelines. It's interesting. It was about this time a month ago. It was the 9th of December when the Flames, actually the 6th of December when the Flames went on their big losing streak. And this time last month, we were sitting here thinking, crap, the Flames may have finally lost all the momentum they built, but they've turned it around quite well. This past week, the Flames had three games. Last week, you and I both predicted they'd get out of the week with four points or two wins, and they only ended up getting out of the week with two points, uh, a win against the Canucks. But I think it was a really good week to test the the makeup of this team. Um, If we look back on that week, we had the Red Wings, which are a tough team, and I thought that a 3-2 score in that game was quite a good showing by the Flames. What about you? Oh, definitely. And sometimes you run into excellent players that have a good game. And Gustav Nyquist in that game beat the Calgary Flames. His passing ability is just off the charts. He found Zetterberg and Abdelkader, and not much you can do in situations when a star takes over the game. Exactly. Friday night, the uh, your other favorite team, the Florida Panthers, were in town, and I think we can all say that that game was not a very good showing of goaltending from either side. No. When there's 11 goals scored and only two would have been legitimate goals on any goaltender, yeah, not a very good game for the goalies. That was kind of the game I was expecting from Al Montoya. I think anytime you get a goaltender behind a guy like Luongo or... Brodeur, a guy who plays, you know, seven, eight games a year, you tend to see them in a more of a rusty state. But I was really disappointed by what we saw from Hiller that game. Definitely. And that paved the way for Yanni Ordio to make his season debut. Yeah, he came in Saturday night in the back to back uh on the road against the Canucks and ended up getting not only a season debut, but a donut. I think that might be his first shutout at the NHL level. Yes, it is. So he came in, got the shutout, and I mean, Vancouver is a good team, so to get a shutout against the Canucks, they're not as, you know, perhaps powerful as they once were, but they're still a good team, so to get that shutout, that's a big thing for him. So congrats to Yoni for that one. Yeah, definitely, and I'm wondering if uh, we'll see him play against Arizona. So that that's a good question about Ordeo. So... Um, Ramo is apparently almost ready to go again already, and with the Flames having their four-day break, he'll probably at least be ready to back up on Thursday. If you were the coach, what would you do with Ordeo? Would you keep him here until he, uh, until the hot streak wears off? Would you send him back down? Would you run three goalies for the rest of the season? What would you do? Well, I think because he had the shutout, you have to give him one more game, just as like a... Thank you for coming in and getting a shutout. I wouldn't keep him for very much longer after that, especially if Ramos 100%, just because it's a little weird to have three goalies. We could see one of the two guys, Ramo or Hiller, get traded at the trade deadline as well. So it depends and plus if Ordeo does have a very good game if he plays against Arizona that would make the management look at the trading of one of the goalies as not like oh we're throwing in the towel cuz we have another guy that's doing great yeah no for sure and i think i think you're right is just like we've seen a lot of the forwards prove themselves this year have been called up I think this is now Ramos or uh, Ramos' time to show that he deserves to stay here and also Ordeo's time to say that, you know what, I deserve the call-up. And, yeah, it may lead to some difficult decisions at the deadline. We've talked about that. I think that the Flames need some pieces. 
and the easiest thing to move might be one of the goaltenders. Definitely. And if you look for the Flames in like three or four years when they're in contender mode, Jonas Hiller and Kari Ramo are not going to be your starting goaltenders for that team. So while it's good that they're providing good goaltending this year, you still have to rely on guys like Ordeo, Gillies, and McDonald to figure it out at the NHL level and hopefully one of them turns out to be a good starting goaltender moving forward. And I mean, that's the that's the fine balance, right? Is we don't want to bring up a guy like Ordeo to sit on the bench and play 20 a year. So there's that fine balance of when you bring him up, you got to be ready to put him in. Exactly. And he's showing that he's ready he he has the second highest uh save percentage in the ahl this season which after his stellar start this year sarcasm there <laughs> same thing we saw last year yeah and he's Crap already start, rebounded ECHL to start with and yeah and he's already rebounded to being the second best goalie in the save de- percentage department So he's showing that he could be an NHL goaltender. You have to make room to see if he can actually stick. Yeah, and I think that to me is the big question of if they bring him up, I want to see him get ice time, not just a, okay, it's past the deadline. We're going to play him in a couple games. But I think if you bring him up, you have to play him. And I think part of the decision of if they're going to move a goalie or not is going to have a lot to do with where they're sitting at the deadline standings-wise. If they're in contention for a playoff spot i don't think i would bring audio up because i'd want two more experienced goalies at that point if we're out of that spot then it might make more sense oh i agree no, neither of those goalies are in their last year you can always move them at the draft if you have to well ramo's done at the end of the year oh okay so so there you go so if anyone's going to be moved it's probably ramo to get some value unless you're going to the playoffs yeah and the thing I liked about Ordeo's game against Vancouver is his composure in the net and his focus during the play. It's something that we haven't really seen since Kipper, really. Well, and and I noticed that last year, too, in the few games he played up here last year, is he seemed to have the focus of an NHL goalie. Didn't look like a guy who was making mistakes and that sort of thing that we'd often see from an AHL goalie. So, yeah, I agree. He went into that Vancouver game, and you could tell he was reading the play really well. And he he does. There's a lot of tendencies there that are Kipper-like. Mm-hmm. The other reason it might make sense to put him in against the Coyotes, if you look at the schedule coming up, they're one of the few teams we play next week and even the week after that's below us in the standings. So if you're going to put him in, why not put him at the team that's you know just above Edmonton in the West? Um, you know, It seems like a good game to put your call-up goalie into. Yeah. And Hiller could use some more time off. And, like, earlier when Ramo got the few starts uh, in a row at the end of November, uh, Hiller's game rebounded when he finally drew back in. So having Hiller get, like, a full week off, or I think it's actually a week and a day, if he doesn't play against Arizona... I think that would help him to refocus his abilities. For sure. And, I mean, you could even give him a couple more days off if you decide to start Ramo against the Sharks on Saturday. Um, you know, then he, you could give him almost till the following Monday against the Kings off. So, yeah, there's a lot of options there, which is nice. But, no, I agree with you. I think Ordeo deserves one more game at least. I don't want to keep him here if he's not going to be playing. I think that the best place for him is Adirondack in the long term this season. But I think this is his chance to create his own destiny, if you will, and show the team uh, what he can do. Exactly. And we also have to figure that they're going to be auditioning for roles next year as well. And can you rely on Yanni Ordeo to, say, be the backup next year? And yeah. if he comes up, has only the one good game, and there's no other games to draw on he'll still be a question mark so whether it's like right now or later in the season after the trade deadline he needs to get some more action in i agree 
And I think the other nice thing we have is with a guy like Hiller, as much as you're right, he's probably not going to be the goalie going forward. He does give us some flexibility for the next couple of years. So if we say, you know what, Ordeo's the guy, but not right now, I think with Hiller as the starter, you can buy yourself another year if you need to. Oh, definitely. It's not as though we're going crap. We don't have Kipper. We don't have anybody. Um, you know, we need this guy up here now. I think that it buys us some time if we need it. And I'd rather take that time seeing what Ordeo could be and get the best out of them than just rush them into the lineup. Yeah, and it it's better to be in a situation like we are currently where you're we have too many goalies instead of last year where you had Joey McDonald, Kari Ramo, and Red O'Bara, all of whom were questionable going into the season. Well, and it's not something that we're very familiar with as Flames fans in general. We generally have not had a wealth of goaltending in this organization. No, it's basically been Vernon and Kipper, and that's about it. <laughs> yeah, you could put Kid in there for a while. I mean, we've had some interesting goalies come in and out of town, but yeah, I mean, Vernon, Kipper, um, you know, Trevor Kid for a while, but we haven't really drafted and had a wealth of them. I mean, you remember the year we went through every goalie there was to go through because they kept getting hurt, and Freddie Brathwaite was the only guy we could get to stick. Mm-hmm. You know, so we've we've we it's been a while since we've had depth at goaltending, which is really nice to see. On uh, the day that the Panthers rolled into town on Friday, we also heard that the Flames made a trade. So there's probably a trade made with the GM sitting at lunch. A player that I didn't expect the Flames to trade, um, Corbin Knight, was sent to the Panthers. We acquired him from the Panthers, didn't we? Yes, we did for a fourth round pick. So we're sending him back to the Panthers in exchange for Drew Shore. A play, another centerman, a guy who I'm not too familiar with. I've seen play a few times. Um, what do you think about Drew Shore? He's a solid overall player, and if you're expecting him to be a top six forward, you're probably going to be disappointed. But he is a solid, reliable two-way player. Based on what I've seen of him, he seems like a little bit of a better version, perhaps a little bit weaker at the face-off dot, but overall a little bit better rounded than Corbin Knight. Yeah, that's pretty much how I would put it. He can do a little bit better offensively. He has a little better of a shot. He, I think he's a little bigger height-wise. It just, you know, it's a slight upgrade, and with the flexibility of Shore possibly being able to be converted to a right winger, which would help for, you know, we only have Poirier, so that would help address yeah. the need there. And Drew Shore, for what it's worth, is also a year younger. Corbin Knight's 24, Drew Shore's 23. Uh, this year with the San Antonio Rampage, where he's been playing, Drew Shore's played 35 games. He has 9 goals, 21 assists, and 30 points, as compared to Corbin Knight, who played... The majority of the year in Adirondack, 22 games, 8 goals, 4 assists for 12 points, as well as 2 appearances with the Flames, where he got no points. Yeah, and for players under the age of 24 in the AHL, Drew Shore is actually 6th in the entire league. So, that's pretty good as an offensive player. You, usually yeah. a player, if they're under the age of 24 and they're generating close anywhere close to a point per game down there, they should transition into the NHL, but we'll see. Yeah, I don't think Corbin Knight was ever a guy that was slated to be a top six forward either, so I don't think we're losing much on this deal, if anything. I think that we're just addressing different needs. True. It's more or less like trading a guy like David Steckel for a guy like Chris Clark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's probably a good way to put it. I think we're getting a a different forward. We're getting a guy who's maybe not as strong in the faceoff dot. And I think Corbin Knight, since he got here, has kind of been looked at um, the faceoff specialist for the Flames, if you will. That guy who you know will win faceoffs. And if I remember right, his call up here, he did pretty well in the faceoffs even at this level. But when I've watched him play in Adirondack this year, he just there seemed like there was something missing from his game. Yeah, and when he was in college, he was one of the top offensive players, and it seemed like that entirely vanished in the last season and a half, and it's a little bizarre because he's not a bad offensive player. 
and for whatever reason he just couldn't get anything to go. Yeah. And when you you figure the Flames have Bennett, Backlund, uh, Monahan, and Jankowski in the pipeline up the middle, not to mention Juris and Granlund, they, the odds of Knight being able to beat out multiple players from that list was starting to look iffy at best. Yeah, and I think that's a good point, as you said earlier, for converting him to wing. I think if you're a guy coming into that depth chart, you look at it and go, you know what, there's probably not a lot of shot of me making this NHL team at center. So it'd be my best interest to try and convert myself to a winger. Definitely. Be- because the depth charts are short on both wings. Yeah, and if you look at uh, the Flames organizationally, we don't have too many right shooters. So if we do convert him into a right winger, we'll actually have one that's proper for that position. Because, like, Poirier, he's a left-handed shot, so he's not really playing on the right side. Yeah, and and I think that Drew Shore is a good enough player from what we've seen so far that he could make this team in a bottom six role as a winger. Well, in the 67 games he's played at the NHL level, he has 20 points. Which, for a third-line type guy, 20 points, 25 points, that's actually fairly decent production. That's good production, especially from a young guy like that. Yeah. And, like, if he ever even has a 40-point season, like, that's phenomenal for a depth player. Yeah, it is. Um, in, and we'll talk more about this later, but um, in Tre Living's interview today, apparently he was mentioning that Shore's waiver status is a concern because he has played enough NHL games. He has to clear waivers, um, and that will probably play a decision. Maybe he doesn't get called up as quickly as he would otherwise because Tre Living thinks, and I think he's probably right, that if he's waived, we'll lose him. Yeah, and if he um, goes it to Adirondack and is exceptional, Perhaps you just keep him down there for the remainder of the season, <clears throat> and next year he starts in the NHL. Yeah, I think that would be the way to do it, because I'd hate to lose him on waivers just to try him out. We've seen this guy play at the NHL level. I think that's the difference from a lot of our prospects down there. He has you know 60-odd games that we can watch footage of, so we know how he competes at the NHL level. Yeah, and if it wasn't for Florida having three really good centers ahead of him, plus Vincent Trocek, they probably wouldn't have dealt him. But they do, and so they needed to go in a different direction. You have to wonder, um, as Corbin Knight, how it feels to have been traded away by the Panthers and then to come back to the Panthers. I bet that's kind of a weird feeling. Yeah. It's like this team doesn't want you, and then all of a sudden they want you back. Yeah. Well, I think he they wanted him the entire time. It's just that he was looking at their depth chart and said no. So. And now he's back. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good move for both organizations. I think it's going to be a change of scenery for both guys. And from what I've seen of Drew Shore, without going back and pulling out a video, just watching some AHL stuff from this year, um, I'm happy with the move. Oh, so am I. I think this is actually Tre Living's first trade as in, as the Calgary Flames GM. Yes, it is. Well, second, but that was dra- a draft pick for Bolig, so right. I don't really count that. Like this is the first player for player trade. There you go. So this will now go in the record books. Brad Tre Living's first trade is a NHL GM player for player trade is a Calgary Flames GM, and I bet the trade of the draft was probably mostly organized by Berkey because he was still getting into the role, but. Corbin Knight for Drew Shore. Nothing fancy, but it'll help with the depth chart. Yeah, and I recall us talking about the uh, how the Flames are depth deep in the center and left wing position, and that perhaps we should look for trades to address the areas that we're weak in. Like, a, I think it was like three or four months ago. So it's nice to see that the Flames made a move where. They actually shuffled the prospects around to actually address the areas that they were weak in. Yeah, for sure. And I think the other thing that we're not giving Drew Shore credit for here is we have a very young AHL team. And I think that even though he's 23, he has a lot of 
hockey experience, especially six, seven games at the NHL level. So I think that's going to help him kind of bring some leadership and bring some veteran quality to the AHL squad this year. Definitely. And in college, he played on a line with Joe Colborn. So at least if he does get a recall, he'll have somebody that he played well with. We know where to put him. The third move that was made this week, which I've been saying I would probably do since I think the beginning of the season, um, Brian McGratton was put on waivers and cleared waivers and has now been sent down to Adirondack. Um, We've seen that he really hasn't been playing that much this year. Every time you and I have talked about getting rid of a a veteran player to make room for a young player, I've always said, you know, as much as I don't want it to be, I think it should be McGratton because he's not playing. Looks like Trilliving finally pulled the trigger on that one. What are your thoughts on that? It sucks, really. And nobody likes to see a guy like McGratton go. His personality and what he brings to the team off the ice were both extremely pleasant additions to the team. Unfortunately, it's a roster game and... You look at all the guys in Adirondack, like you have David Wolf, who's got, I think, 14 or 15 points right now, and he's kind of the same guy. Like, how do you justify keeping McGratton, the hockey player, on the ice in the press box when you have other guys that are proving more at the AHL level? that require NHL spots. And, you know, we're talking about McGratton. We've, we, you mentioned it now, and we've talked about in the past, that he's a good kind of liaison for the community and stuff. And if you think about it that way, again, perhaps he's what Adirondack needs. Perhaps he's the veteran guy who can come in, be a great face for that team, you know, shake the hands, meet with the, the kids and the charities and that sort of thing. And I think that even though he's not a star player, he brings some NHL credibility to to the AHL team, even if he's not playing, that you know he can bring some of that news from Calgary, if you will. You know, here's how the dressing room works up there, and that sort of thing. Yeah, and he can mentor a guy like Wolf on the fisticuffs aspect, and give players pointers on like the pitfalls that he encountered when he was a young NHL player, and like it's where he went to, off yeah, the rails. A- yeah, he's got a lot of experience there with conquering his demons. And you're right, that could be something that he could offer those young guys. Do you think that this now signals um, the end of the dedicated fighter in the league? We've seen a couple fighters waived so far this year and not be claimed. Well, the fact that you have the defending reigning champ of the fighters in the NHL go through waivers and nobody picks them up, I think that's pretty much the final nail in the coffin for the dedicated, just, you know. Tough guy. Yeah, just go out there and fight the guy, their guy. Yeah. Which, that's a good thing, because, you know, you don't want to see players getting concussions and all that. We'll see how the other players react, the Matt Cook class of players, and see if we start seeing an increase in cheap shots. If that occurs, then I could see the fighter Kai coming back. For sure. And, I mean, this is a role that we've been very familiar with here in town. We always seem to have had that role on our roster, be it, you know, Tim Hunter, Ronnie Stern, Sandy McCarthy, Barube, Oliwa, uh, Simon, Rocky Thompson... Wah, like it it always seems to be somebody here um that has done that and yeah it just seems like it it's part of the flames dna a lot more than other teams so i guess it's weird to see them finally put that nail in the coffin that we're moving away from this well the coach or the gm he was saying that uh if i recall correctly um that you need all the forwards to be able to play at the NHL level. And honestly, McGratton as a hockey player was a weak point on the team. We've seen a little bit of shines of, you know, something there, but it just hasn't been consistent enough to say, yeah, this guy's a good hockey player. Yeah. And, you know, having Brandon Bolig 
as his replacement, Bullig can play as an NHL player. And he's basically been a lot very similar to what Lance Boma brings. And he can fight as well. So if you can get players that can do both, like David Wolf has in Adirondack, then I could see the position evolving in that direction. But for now, I think the one-trick pony type guys, I think, are going to be phased out. And when you and I talked at the beginning of the season, we talked about spots on the roster that we thought were up for grabs. And we both said said Sedaguchi's spot was up for grabs, which we've seen. We thought maybe someone like uh, David Jones' spot would be up for grabs, but I didn't think we would see McGratton's spot be given up to a young player almost simply as just a roster move. We need to keep so many good players that we got to send McGratton down. Yeah, and it is disappointing, but with the unexpected exceptional play from a whole host of players in the organization... It, it simply just became a numbers game, and yeah. somebody had it's to go. It's disappointing, but exciting at the same yeah. time. Well, it, it's just like when Conroy retired from Calgary, and like everybody was really disappointed to that, like, oh, he's not going to be on the ice anymore, even though as a player he was probably ready to retire. Yeah, for sure. I don't think we've seen the last of McGratton. I think maybe as a Calgary Flames player, but I don't think we've seen the last of McGratton within the Calgary Flames organization. No. I think there's a guy who is so good with the community. There's a guy who seems to really like it in Calgary, he and his wife. I think he's going to be one of these guys that hangs around as a Flames alumni guy for a long time. We see these old, you know, old school guys that are doing everything for the alumni, and I can see McGratton being one of those guys. Yeah, and the fans love Brian McGratton. They do. And, you know, he's earned everybody's respect. And, you know, it's a two-way street. And I'm hoping that he does remain in Calgary because the fans do like him just like they like Conroy. Yeah. I don't see McGratton necessarily having an office job or a coaching job. I'm not sure he's the right guy for that. But I can see him working with guys like Jim Poplinski on the alumni stuff. I mean, we see Poplinski all over the place. I can see him doing some of the charity work or some of the work for, you know, the uh, Calgary Flames various charities like the kids sport and that sort of thing. And I think that could be a good role for him. Yeah, almost like a community ambassador ish type role or or something. Yeah. Like there there's a role for him. It's just figuring out what suits him best. Exactly, and I think he could be that alumni for the new generation. Like, I've talked to some Flames fans recently who don't know who any of the current guys that always come out for alumni games are. You know, they don't know who Poplinski is, and they don't know who Tim Hunter is, and they don't know a lot of these guys that we see out at the Flames community events, Dana Merzen and guys like that. But I think that, you know, modern NHL fans know McGratton, and so that could be a really good thing there is to usher in that younger guy who's the alumni face yeah well it didn't help that in the late 90s early 2000s that there wasn't really too many guys that were notable enough to be even known in the first place yeah and i mean a lot of guys have moved out of town and all sorts of things but it seems like uh brian and his wife really like it here and so i could see them sticking around mm-hmm and I hope he does. I also don't think necessarily we've seen the last of him as a flame. I think that if, especially if this team makes it to the postseason when there's no upper roster limit, I think you might see him get brought back here just as an insurance policy. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if we're making the postseason, I don't think as many young guys are going to be brought up to see what they've got because you want to ice the best team you have. And with no upper roster, we're paying them anyways. I could see him saying, you know what, Brian, we're going to bring you back just in case we need you. Yeah. Well, usually they have like 27 or 28 guys anyway. So just yeah. so that like everybody is practicing properly just in case a whole bunch of injuries happen or whatever. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, just in case injuries or, you know, someone like Bow League or Boma goes down and they might say we need some muscle. He's not the best player, but he's the muscle we need. Exactly. So that's the only scenario I can see him coming back. But do you think that after this, McGratton's career in 
North America is over? Do you think anyone will pick him up after this? Uh, it depends on how the play goes for the rest of the season. Like, if things start getting really chippy, because, uh, like, a lot of teams have shed their fighter guy, so we'll see if things change uh, over the last 40 games. If things more or less stay the same where there's no real dirty incidents, then... I don't know as if McGratton would get an NHL job. He might get an AHL job, but I don't think he'll, you know, it depends. Like everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll see. But it's it's sad to see him go. Like you said, he's been a great face of this team. And I think ever since Jerome left, he stepped up into a bigger role there that needed to be filled. And I give him a lot of credit for doing that because often the fighter isn't the guy that's doing a lot of community stuff. He's supposed to be the big nasty guy. Mm-hmm. But... McGratton, I think, filled that role well, and it's going to be something that somebody else is going to have to come do now. Mm -hmm. Maybe it gives a young guy an opportunity. Maybe a guy like Juris says, yeah, I'll take over some of that face of the flames of the public, or you know, could be a a David Jones or Matt Stajan has jumped into that role as well. He could take on more, but that's something I think that we're underestimating that we're going to miss from him. I agree. Earlier today, Brad Treliving had a, I guess you'd call it a State of the Union um, interview on Fan 960. And we didn't want to put the whole interview up here talk about everything, but we pulled out some of the key points that he talked about. Um, Matt, you were mentioning here that one of the things you found most interesting was his trade deadline talk. And he said there's an A, B, and C plan that I guess will get executed based on where the Flames are sitting. So I would imagine there's a plan if they're in, if they're out, or if they're just barely in. Do you think those are probably the three scenarios? Yeah. Like, if the Flames are, say, like, in fourth or fifth when the trade deadline happens, then, you know, that's plan A. Let's see if we can add a defenseman or something like that. If they're out, then let's jettison the veterans that are UFA. And if we're in the middle, then maybe you only pick one or two of those veterans to get traded. And I think the Flames are going to be in a really unique spot come the deadline, more so than other teams who perhaps are in the playoff hunt, because we're in the playoff hunt unexpectedly, but we're still also trying to finish off this rebuild and keep things moving, I guess, positively down that road. So I think the Flames are going to have to be more careful as far as what they're giving up there and maybe not bringing in some of the players they'd really like to because it's going to cost them too much in the rebuild. Yeah, and like if they're going to add, I think it would be pieces that you would be having on the team for like the next four or five years, not mm-hmm. just a rental type. Knowing what the rental prices have been over the last couple of years, I don't think we can afford a rental. No, and I think with having guys like Poirier, Berchi, Shore, and a few others on the farm that have been doing it rather well, that if you were to trade off some of the veteran guys, you could pretty much not skip too much of a beat. In terms of the rebuild, I agree. In terms of postseason this year, I disagree. I don't think that some of those guys are ready to take this team into the postseason. So if you are looking at the rebuild, I think you're right. We can get rid of some of the veterans and still have players ready to be brought up in their place. But if I look at those names as far as if the team wants to go deep in the rebuild, I think that that unfortunately might make them keep some veterans around that perhaps they'd move otherwise. Well, it also depends on who you're talking about. Like if it's a guy like Weidman, I don't see him moving unless we're like completely out of it and a team comes up with a good offer. But a guy like, say, Glenn Cross, I think you could pencil in a guy like Poirier instead and not really like even if we are trying to go for the playoffs and I don't think you would miss that much and we've seen some teams that have sold on deadline day and yet still roll into the playoffs rather effectively so that's true it it depends a lot on who what and what's gonna be what the situation is And that's where I think the Flames deadline could be very interesting. I think they could be buyers and sellers all at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, buying from one team and selling to somebody else. And 
I think that, you know, we don't see a lot of teams that do that, but I think that might be the scenario we're in this year. Yeah, where we add like a number five defenseman and trade off a couple of forwards or something. Or, yeah, trade a couple farm forwards for, a, you know, four or five defensemen where we're essentially getting rid of some young pieces but adding one better young piece. You know, trading off some veterans maybe for a draft pick and then flipping that draft pick for somebody else. Um, I think there's a lot of options there that could be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Another thing the GM said, and before we go further with this, I want to mention too, it seems as though we've heard the least from the GM of the Calgary Flames than we have in any year I can remember. Like I was looking at this today and when we heard Tro Living was going to talk, it's like this monumental thing. Like we're hearing from him for you know, the first time, and it hasn't been the first time, but we're not seeing him in front of the camera as much as we have a Feaster or, you know, Sutter, guys like that. He's really been letting Hartley do the talking. And that's a good thing because it allows him to focus on the job of improving the team. Yeah. No, for sure. I just, I thought it was worth pointing out because it's kind of an interesting uh, change from how we've normally seen the Flames GMs. Um, but one thing he did say is he didn't expect Goudreau to produce the way that he has so far, which I think we've all been pleasantly surprised by Johnny Goudreau's season. And he thinks there's there are other young guys who are ready to play at the NHL level, which I think we all agree with. We've seen some of them. I think there's probably some guys that we haven't seen yet that are also at that level. Yeah, and if you look at Adirondack, their first line of Berchi, Arnold, and Poirier, for like the last five or six games they played with each other, they've just been unbelievable together. It's been a really nice line to watch, yeah. So it, it'll be interesting to see how you manage those two guys as they have been ri- pretty much ripping the AHL apart. For sure. And, you know, again, that's where deadline day we may have to pick or maybe not even deadline day, but over the next, say, you know, couple, maybe year, I'd say deadline day just because you might get maximum value there, but we may have to pick which ones we want to keep and which ones we're willing to flip, knowing we're giving up a good asset, but to get another great asset. You know, maybe trade one of them for a defenseman or something like that. Um, But yeah, really good to see those guys playing as well as they are. I think it's a great thing. Um, I think we're all surprised, especially by Goudreau, from a guy who barely made the team out of camp like he was the last i think he was the last guy announced for the team wasn't he goudreau yeah well i think like everybody was expecting him to go to the ahl for a little while to get his game together and then come up i know we were we talked about that at the beginning of the season another thing that he um another thing that was mentioned and it was it was kind of brought up that our ahl team is one of the youngest in the ahl so that speaks a lot, as you were saying, for the guys like Sven and Poirier, who are playing well there, um, to be doing so well without that veteran leadership. I mean, we have a couple guys. We've got the Corey Potter, Yonkman, guys like that, but they're one of the younger ones. And so for these young players to be doing as well as they are, it sounds like they almost want to keep some of those guys down there for extended AHL stints. They're not worried about perhaps some of them you know, hitting their ceiling, I guess, in the AHL. Yeah, and if you look at other good teams like, say, Utica, uh, Vancouver's farm team, their team is pretty much entirely composed of veteran guys. And, like, put it this way, for comparison, David Wolf has, like, three or four more points than Hunter and Carrick for Utica. And that's pretty much their top prospect in Utica. So... The fact that the Flames are getting such excellent play from a whole host of young forwards, that shows the strength of our actual prospect pool, whereas other teams that have excellent AHL clubs might be getting by because they have so many quality veteran AHLers. Well, that's it. I I went back on the weekend and actually looked this up, and I was looking at the teams that won the... Calder Trophy down there over the last five and si- five or six years. And yeah, most of them were simply teams that seemed like they had so many NHL quality players they couldn't fit them all. So they dumped them down to the AHL and you were really expecting those teams to be strong because of that. But the Flames, I mean, this was a group, as they say, that have very little AHL experience and they've done so well. So I think that's both a tr- uh, tribute to the players and how well they've done, but also the coaching staff for bringing these guys along so well. Mm -hmm. 
I think that sometimes the coaching staff down there perhaps doesn't get as much credit as they deserve, but I think we've seen a big change with how coaching's been managed in the AHL and trying to work on the same system as the Flames and that sort of thing. Yeah. And for the AHL, also the Adirondack Flames are, I think, 22-11 and 11 or something like that against teams that aren't Utica, and yet they've lost all seven games to them. You know, every team, it seems like, even, even the Calgary Flames every year, it seems like there's always one team that stymies you, mm-hmm. that you just can't get through. And we've seen it with the Flames in the past where, you know, we've lost the whole series to Vancouver or Edmonton. So there always seems to be one team that you just can't get past. And, yeah, for for Adirondack, it seems to be Utica. Yeah, Jakob Markstrom. Markstrom's a good goalie. I think he'd stymie a lot of people. Yeah, well, he's been a real thorn in their side. He has. And talking about young goalies earlier with Ordeo, there's another really good goalie to watch for a number of years. I think Markstrom's going to make it big in the NHL. Yeah, it's just taken him a while to figure it out but he's been pretty much top-notch every game down there. Some of the best goalies, though, have matured late. Well, look at Kipper. Enough said. Like That's He was true. 27 before he actually cemented a starting spot. So Yeah, no, that's that's true for sure. Um, another note out of the GM's conference this morning was that Bennett is uh, skating. He's ahead of schedule on his injury. He's skating in a non-contact role. Did they say when they expect Bennett to be back in a contact role at practice? Uh, they're basically letting him skate and get back up to pace until the end of the month, and then he'll be starting to go to like a full-on practice in the beginning of February. I think that's probably the big thing to remember, too, is this guy is a young player who's been out all season, so he's going to have a lot more rust than, say, a seasoned NHL player might. I mean, this is a guy who, even when he comes back, we're going to see a lot of rust from him. I don't think he'll be able to step back in and make the impact that we've seen, say, from Michael Backlund coming off his injury. Well, the thing is with him, uh, like I know some people have said, oh, just send him back to the OHL right away, like once he's healthy. But he did make the team out of camp before his injury was uncovered. So you have to give him an opportunity in practice even just to see if he is showing enough where he's available for the nine game stint if he's a little sluggish send him back have fun in the ohl and you know see you next year but if he does perform well which i don't see why he wouldn't then give him the nine game stint and let him try to stick i agree with you i think we might see him not perform as well and say a nine game period is some people might have expected just because he has been off the ice for as long as he has. But yeah, I think that he's deserved at least the right to get his nine game look. And worst case scenarios after the nine games, you send him back and no harm done. And he can just focus on coming to camp next year, 100% and making the team day one. Exactly. And, and that's, I think not a, I think that if he plays the way that we know he can play, he will make the team next year. Well, you got to figure for how well he played in the preseason with a bum shoulder that, you know, he, now that he's better, he should be able to play even better. Oh, for sure. And I think that he's a player, too, that the fans are so looking forward to seeing that it's not like putting him on the ice is going to tank us. I think even if we're competitive, um, he's still a good guy to put out there and could still be competitive for us. So I think that... Yeah, you've got to give him a look this year. Yeah, and, you know, it's up to him to either sink or swim for this year anyway. And it'll be a good story to watch at the end of the month and heading into the trade deadline. I think even if we bring him back, um, by the time he's ready, it'll probably be after deadline so we can carry as many players as we want at that point on the pro roster. But I think even if he comes back and plays for nine games, line three minutes, line two minutes, that sort of thing. I think it's going to help him at least get back on the ice after so long and show him exactly what the NHL pace is. So next year when he's training in the offseason, they go, okay, you've had your nine-game shot. This is where you got to be come in in September. Definitely. I don't think we're going to see him get 
maybe what we would have expected of, you know, one, two line minutes solid after coming back from that long of an injury. No. And with next month being pretty much the month from hell, if he can come in and produce any offense, then I that would definitely help the Flames' chances next month. If you look ahead to the schedule next month, only the New Jersey game at the end of the month is what I would consider an easier game. All the rest of them are against teams that are better than the Flames at the moment, and yeah, not fun. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing, too. Strategically, he could be a guy that could come in to spell off a veteran who needs to sit for a night. True. So there's ways you can use him there to give guys, you know, a night off and that sort of thing. Um, we didn't cover every topic that was covered in Living's interview today, but if you want to hear it all, the Fan 960 website has it streaming. Uh, so you can go listen to it there, download it. But from I didn't hear it all. Um, I'm going to listen to it in its entirety. I heard about the first half. And it, it's a good interview. It's kind of your state of the union at the halfway point. And there's a lot of optimism there. Well, the Flames have done a lot to be optimistic moving forward, so... Well, that's it. And I guess it's just, it's nice to hear, I guess, that, you know, for once we have a state of the union where we're optimistic. And we're actually hearing words like playoffs and postseason. I know. And it's foreign territory lately. Yeah, for sure. Um, one more note, it looks like today uh, the All-Star rosters were announced and two Flames are going to be going to All-Star weekend. So both our captain, Mark Giordano, and our rookie sensation, Johnny Goudreau, have been selected to the Western All-Star team. Well, Goudreau's only going to be participating in the skills competition. Uh, oh, is he? Okay. Do they still do the Young Stars game? No, unfortunately. That was like the second best part of the weekend. I used to watch the Young Stars game and not the actual NHL game. Yeah, same here. The skills competition is by far the best part. The Young Stars game was next, and most times I didn't even watch the All-Star game itself. I'm, I've am i never been a big fan of the skills competition, and ever since the year that Ovechkin put on the, what was it? The oh, Elvis the glasses. The shootout. Yeah, the glasses and the hat and two yeah, sticks and Yeah, and ever since that. then I haven't watched it. It just seems like it's become a big joke after yeah. that. The last really good All-Star game was back when Owen Nolan pointed on Dominic Kasich and picked the corner. That was like the last really good all-star game all the rest since then have just been like any other game really to me it's not so much the all-star game i'm interested in it's always who's nominated to that roster yeah you know i think that they could almost get rid of the game and do the all-star roster and i think it's cool that for the flames who really have been an insignificant team for the last couple years really haven't had a lot of star players that were being acknowledged that our captain and our rookie sensation deserve, you know, to at least go to the weekend. Definitely. So even though Gudra won't be playing in the actual game, um, I I hope maybe one of them can win one of the uh, one of the skills comp challenges for the Flames. I don't know if the Flames have ever actually taken home a skills comp challenge. I don't know. So hopefully one of them can do it. But it'll be good to see them there. Yep. And congrats to Zemgus Gergensens of the Buffalo Sabers for getting named to, to one of the starters courtesy of all the votes coming in from latvia you know there's always ever since the fan voting there's always been the one guy that just gets voted in that we go huh yeah my commissaric commissaric i think one year the flans tried to get Steos on that roster yeah rory fitzpatrick exactly there always seems to be the one guy that maybe isn't an all-star but has a good following be it from his home country or as a farce um, and maybe the league needs to look at how they do that. You know, maybe the fan voting becomes part of the waiting there. Yeah. Do you remember a couple of years ago when, what was it, they had two captains for the All-Star game and then they drafted their rosters? Oh, yeah, and Phil Kessel was the last guy picked. <laughs> yeah, and again, Ovechkin was like laughing at him and taking pictures of him sitting all by himself, and that seemed like it was just really poorly done as well. Yeah. It was a it was a schoolyard pick'em, and you could tell kind of who was friends with who and that sort of thing. But I have to give the NHL credit for trying things like that, trying something different, and getting rid of it when it didn't work out. Exactly, just like the NHL versus world type thing. See, I actually like that better than the East versus West. Yeah, I wish they were still doing that. I like the North America versus the world concept, um, and 
you know, maybe it's kind of the Olympics World Cup thinking, but I was always rooting for the North American team because they're like, yeah, North America won. Yeah, well... And that's how the AHL does it too, I think. The AHL does Team Canada versus the world. Yeah. One of the things that I thought was interesting, uh, Daryl Sutter brought up a interesting idea of returning back to how the All-Star game was initially done where the defending Stanley Cup champions play against the All-Star team of the rest of the league. That would be interesting. I think that with the movement we see to the roster today in the NHL, it would be hard. Because well, we say if it's what the def- you could do is like anybody that's been traded off or signed somewhere else, have them play on that team. Yeah, so, so like, sure whatever the 20-man roster for the cup winner, those players all play. Yeah, if your name was engraved on the cup, you come back and play. Exactly. Uh, I, it's, an inter- it, it's an interesting idea. I can't see the Players Association liking that one. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, I think something like that might be what they need to change up. Um, I know they'd never do it, but I'd love to see like an NHL all-star team versus an all-star team made up of players from other leagues. Yeah, that would almost have to be something that you would do in the off season. Yeah, well, and, and that would be interesting too, I think, is after you've won the cup, then you have to defend it almost against the all-star team. And maybe that becomes like the first exhibition game almost. Yeah, could be. I mean, look at look at football. Their their All Star season or their All Star game, the Pro Bowl, is done after the end of the season, right? It's after the Super Bowl. Yeah. So the, there's lots of things the NHL could play with there, um, but I think that you know there's probably more pressing matters in the league office right now with relocation, expansion, that sort of thing. But I would not be opposed to them trying some more formats. Definitely. I don't think we've settled on the right one yet. No. And boy, are those All-Star jerseys ugly. Oh, yeah, this year's All-Star jerseys. You know, normally I think the All-Star jerseys are cool because they're different. Like, they don't look like something I'd want to see every day. But if you look back at them, they, they're they di- they're kind of cool because they're something different. But, yeah, these ones are horrible. Yeah, the, probably the, the worst, I think, that they've ever had. And that includes the old 80s bright orange nasty ones. <laughs> I'm on uh, NHLuniforms.com. Shout out to that site. If you've never been there, it's a really cool site. You can go back through every year and every team and see um, what jerseys look like. But I remember back in 2000, 2001, they had jerseys that looked like soccer jerseys. And I still think those ones, again, different and unique because they were different. But I think those might be my least favorite all-star jerseys. Yeah, the best ones were back in uh, 2004 in Minnesota, the retro-themed ones. Yes. That was the best one, in my opinion. Though I've never liked that kind of faux retro dirty white thing. We've seen teams do that before, and that's what those ones had. They had that kind of beigey color. Yeah, I don't mind it personally. I think it's something different, so... But yeah, if anyone who hasn't seen this year's jerseys, the NHL logo's on it, and it's supposed to look almost chrome, almost metallic. It looks really silly. And there's neon green in the jerseys. They all have neon green accents. It almost looks like a, a rejected Penguins jersey. Yeah. Well, plus it has ref stripes on, on the underarm and like yeah. down the sides of the jersey. Like It's just a really... Not well thought out jersey. And the the stripes on the socks from what I saw don't seem to go all the way across either. They're just like a dab of color on the front of the sock. Yeah, uh, it's one of those jerseys that you look at and you go, uh, so what's your actual concept? <laughs> exactly. And it looks like they're trying to save some money on them because according to NHL uniforms, and I hate it when teams do this, they have black numbers on a black jersey that just have the outline on them. And I hate that because it's hard to read on TV usually. Yeah. So they're black numbers on a black back with just a neon green border. Anyway, we won't describe them. It's hard to describe these monstrosities. But go to NHL uniforms or wherever you get your NHL news. I'm sure they'll have a picture of them. We'll tweet a picture as well to our account. But, yeah, these are these are jerseys I think the NHL is going to want to forget. Oh, yeah. Wow, seeing the actual numbers as you're describing them, that's really terrible. Like, if you've ever seen uh, those uh, 
black jerseys that have like the neon outline of the logos. I know they sell them at the NHL stores. Uh, it's that kind of look to it, and yeah, not good. No. We'll tweet a picture of this so everybody can see them. So check our Twitter at Fireside Podcast. But yeah, I don't think these are going to turn out well for TV. And really, these jerseys that are done for one night, you know, they're not like they have to be played all year for the fans there. They're for TV. It's a one day TV event. And I think these are going to look horrible on TV. Yeah. I think the neon green is going to be really bright on HD TVs. <laughs> Get sunglasses. <laughs> Or just don't watch the All-Star game. Yeah, that, that too. I'm not planning on doing so, so have fun. <laughs> but yeah, no, these just seem like, it seems like a whole bunch of pieces from the reject pile of other jerseys that were all put together. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where the Chrome logo comes from. I think it's going to look really silly unless they have some sort of shiny material for it. Yeah, I don't know. So we'll see. We'll see how they look, but... I think yeah, this is a year not to. If you're if you're a collector of All Star jerseys, unless you collect them, you know, just because you want every flame that's been there, this is probably a week a year you can skip. Yeah. I would not pay money for these ones. I wouldn't even take it if it was free. <laughs> Which jersey do you think is worse, these ones or the Flames Heritage Classic jerseys? Well, I actually spent money and bought a Heritage Classic jersey, so yeah. <laughs> If I was, if I wouldn't be willing to take the All Star game for free, and I spent money on the other, uh, yeah, there's our answer. Exactly. <laughs> I actually saw the Heritage Classic jerseys on sale. I think it was at Sport Check in the mall last week for like twenty five bucks. I'm surprised they still have any left. Yeah. Well, Matt, should we wrap it up by looking ahead to this coming week of Flames hockey? Definitely. Let's go. The Flames have a four day. Uh, break right now which is nice the 11th 12th 13th 14th they're off so that should help with some of the injuries and recovery um, and then they go on a little bit of a road swing they have an easy couple weeks this week until we broadcast again uh, we have the uh, Arizona Coyotes I had to be careful what I called them there the Arizona Coyotes on Thursday then Saturday we go to San Jose to take on the Sharks and Monday we take on the Kings so six points on the table, all all away games, and no back to backs. There's a day between each game. What's your prediction? Oh, I think they'll beat the Coyotes because they handled them quite easily in each of the first two contests in Calgary. They might and be. You in, think Audio is going to start that one? I would hope so. I could see it. Like if Ramos a hundred percent, they might just send Ordeo back. But I would hope that they give him the start. They always have a hard time against the Sharks, so maybe they lose that one. And I think they could probably beat the Kings again, just because we seem to have their number for whatever reason. Yeah, I'm gonna go with you. I think that the Flames will beat the Coyotes. Um, if Ordeo is going to stay up, I think that's the game he plays and then he goes back down. I don't see them playing well against the Sharks. They never do. And yeah, I think that they can beat the Kings again. And I think that this week is going to be a bit of a turning point for the Flames. After that, they've got the Ducks. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, they, they have to beat the Kings to take momentum into the Honda Center. And don't worry, Flames fans, about the Honda Center curse. The last five times that they've won in Anaheim, four times have been in the middle of January. So if we're going to win against them, it'll be this upcoming visit. There we go. we got to look at every possible option, right? Every possible way to get a win in that building. Yep. So be optimistic. The Four of the last five victories in the Honda Center, middle of January. So hopefully that trend continues. So you and I are both thinking that we're going to come out with four of six points available this yes. week. And even if we do, that's a that's a good week for the Flames. Definitely. I think another reason they're probably going to be able to beat or at least come out hard against the Coyotes, they have four days off. So that should really help put a, an extra kick in their step as well. Yeah, and even in that game against Detroit, they did come out and play the Red Wings hard and, you know... The Red Wings have a better finish than the Coyotes do too. True. They don't the Coyotes don't have a Gustav Nyquist, a Zetterberg, or a Datsuit. As of now, who knows what what's gonna happen? Trades are happening, but yeah, I don't see any of those guys going to the Coyotes at all. No. 
So it should be a good week to watch Flames hockey. I think even that game against San Jose, if we don't win, it's going to be a good game to watch. I don't see us getting blown out. No, and realistically, I don't think the Flames are going to have too many games the rest of the way where they do get blown out. No, I don't think so either. I think they've shown that they are... A, you know, they're a legitimate contender this year. This wasn't just a stroke of luck at the beginning. Yeah. Well, like, even the three games that they lost in the last two weeks, they were all one-goal games. So it's not like they're losing, like, 6-1 or something like that. And just a note for Flames fans, the game on Monday the 19th against the Kings is a late start. That's an 8.30 p.m. game here. So that's a, a bit of a later game for us. Yeah. Yeah. Take a nap after work and get ready to stay up late and watch the Flames. That's my strategy anyways. <laughs> All right, Matt. Well, we will see you after this uh, three-game road swing, and hopefully we put up at least four points. Yeah, and at least Adirondack has only four more games this month, so it's not too crazy with having to watch like 30 games in a month. And hopefully the Flames can come out strong and kick some butt, and we'll see. Let's yep. do it. Go Flames, go. Go Flames, go. Have a good week, everybody. Talk to you next week, yep. buddy. Take care. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.